We have we have contact. Good morning. It's good to see everybody here today. It's you know the it it's been a while since I had the kids up here for a for the little sermonette kind of thing, you know, and so um, they were kind of out of practice. I will uh, make amends for that and and try to get them up here a little bit more frequently. Uh, I think it's good for them to get a, sh- a little snippet of what we're going to be talking about, hopefully at uh, more of a level that they can they can grab on to. It doesn't do any good to teach and to preach if you're using language the audience doesn't grasp, right? And so anyway, uh, we are, the title of our lesson today, it is, uh, uh, it's Joshua's Battles, Joshua's Battles. Battles, Joshua's victories over his uh, over the enemies of uh, Israel are not entirely unlike the battles that we too wage today. Um, Christians, we fight a threefold uh, force, uh, evil force. It is one that comes from the world. It is an evil force that sometimes uh, comes from the flesh, ourself. Uh, And then obviously there is the devil uh, himself. And so we're, this is, those are the enemies. You know, when we, when we go into battle, there, let me, let me, let me, uh, if, if I can share with you a, a quick illustration, if I can remember the history, uh, the battle of the Carthinians against Rome. Rome, Rome was a really effective army, but they were, they were routed. You know, the, Carthinians, they were before the Romans, and the Romans are going forward, and they're, they're, they just keep pushing forward, they keep pushing, keep pushing forward, they keep pushing forward. But what the Carthinians did was that they kind of let them come in, and they allowed their forces to envelop the Romans. And the Romans were then beat because they were fighting three fronts. And they were not capable of uh, of sustaining the battle. We can, we can win that kind of a battle. We can win against three these three forces, but we have to know exactly how to do that. And so that's what our what we're going to talk about today. Ephesians chapter six verse twelve. It says, "For our battle is not against flesh and blood." but it is against the rulers, it is against the powers, it is against the evil forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And because it's in the heavenly places, it's it's invisible. We can't see it. We, we can recognize it for what it is, but we need to be aware of that. At all times. That's why we have to keep that sober spirit, sober mind. Joshua's victories were by faith. First John chapter five, verse four, it says, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. This and this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Our faith. So there's two things that we get from first John chapter five, verse four, and basically is, We have to be born of God to overcome the world. And so when we're born of God, we, it's good for us to be mindful of who this particular, because we're talking about birth, born of God, who this parent is. Genesis chapter one, verse one, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? He created everything. But what's interesting about this is that if you look at verses, I think, 3, verse 6, verse 9, verse 11, so on and so forth, it says, And God 
said. And then it describes what it was that he was creating. My point is, his very voice commanded these things to come into existence. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that that's pretty impressive. Our son and daughter-in-law are finishing out the basement in, in their house. And uh, there's a bunch of work that goes into that. Um, he's been, they've been at this actually for months because part of the construction involved putting two uh, escape, you know, those uh, window uh, things, you know, they have to be able to, firemen have to be able to get in there with all of their equipment. So they had to dig out one because it wasn't big enough, and then they had to put another one in because they have two bedrooms, and each bedroom had to have one. So they're waiting on the people to do that work, and then it wasn't done right, so it had to be redone. So they finally got that fixed. And so now he's framing out the inside. My point is, they're creating something that's going to be good. It's going to be useful. It's going to, it, it, it's going to benefit them in the long run because it adds value, you know, to their home. But look how long it's taken and it's not done yet. And God said, let there be light. And there was. John chapter 1, verses 3, uh, 3 and 4. In, in John's gospel, he starts out by saying, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. Let me get over here. John chapter 1. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. But look at verses 3 and 4 uh, specifically. It says, All things came into being by Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was the life, and the life was the light of men. Remember, and God said, Let there be light. That's the physical light. You know, sun and you know, in the day and moon and the, uh, in the night sky, we have the stars in the night sky to help l uh, light things, you know, well enough for us to not stumble too much. But when we look at this passage, it adds a different element to light because the light that's being talked about in verse four, it's not really a visible per se light. This is one of those aspects of that spiritual warfare that we wage. It is, it is an element of that battle that we must have in order for us to be victorious. In, in, in the creation, in this work that John describes that Jesus was involved in, that Genesis talks about that God did by, by mere speaking. Um, there's a reason for all of this. In Matthew, Jesus' first sermon that we have, uh, verses 25 and following, he says, For this reason, I say to you, do not be anxious about your life as to what you shall eat or what you shall drink nor for your body as to what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and the body than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they don't sow, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? This creation that we have around us was given to us to take care of, but it supplies our needs. How many of y'all had Corn on a cob this past Thanksgiving. There's not a whole lot of hands being raised. Guys, we're in Nebraska. We grow corn. Eat corn. Okay, now I will say my 
diet parameters tell me not to eat corn because of the sugar content, but it's Thanksgiving, okay? I ate a lot. Anyhow. And I was thankful for it. Um, verse 8 of chapter 6. Therefore, don't be like them, for your heavenly Father knows what you need even before you ask. This creation God gave to take care of us. Luke chapter 12, verse 30. We're going to be looking at a lot of passages, so keep your page turners wet there. <clears throat> For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek, but your Father knows that you need these things. Another disciple, another author, another writer of the New Testament, again pointing out, God knows exactly what we need. And, and he's not going to leave us worrying about it. Um, our passage in 1 John, though, it did use the phrase, born of God. And you can't really look at that passage and not think also of rebirth. Because that is truly part of it. John chapter 3, verses 3 through 7, uh, you know, it, it mentions in there how important this rebirth is. Jesus says, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God that's talked about here, it's another one of those invisible things. Our, our neighbor uh, right next to us, they're putting up a fence. And it's not a, it's not a very effective fence because they got part of it done and, and, and they're, for whatever reason, not able to finish one part of it. So they don't let their dogs out because it's not going to keep their dogs in. It doesn't have a proper boundary around it. We can see that. The kingdom that is talked about here, it is a spiritual kingdom. It doesn't really have any boundaries other than the parameters by which God has said you're able to enter. Also, if we don't follow those parameters, we're not going to get in. So there is a barrier there. And that's why Jesus says, if you want to see this kingdom, you have to be born again. He continues in verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? He can't enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? And that's the point that Jesus is making here. It's not something you can see, uh, Nick. It's, it doesn't work that way. Truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. This rebirth is something that is of God. <clears throat> we have to do that. We have to be able, we, in order for us to be victorious, like 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 says, we have to experience this birth. Why is that? We have a foe that is before us. First John chapter 5, verse 19 talks about uh, uh, who this foe is. We're also going to look at a passage in uh, the Corinthian letter, but in First John chapter 5, verse 19, it says here, "We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The whole world. Remember, this threefold force that we fight. The world is the first one listed. My, we have to understand that this is a battle that we will continuously be involved in. That's why Paul says to the Ephesians, 
we are soldiers of Christ. Not exactly like that guy. We are soldiers of Christ with a specific uniform. There are both defensive and offensive items in that uniform that we as soldiers of Christ must use. Uh, the whole world. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Notice what it says here. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 3, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Verse 4, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the glory, uh, light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That's sad. That is a very sad passage to read. Because there, we know, we, it's something that we know. Everybody needs Christ. Everybody needs to be in the kingdom of God. Scripture is very clear when it says, wide is the passage, uh, uh, is the road that leads, leads to destruction, but narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life. Few enter thereby. But we have a friend. Let's go back to 1 John. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. <clears throat> you are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than... What, is it, what does it say? Go ahead and say it. He... Greater is he who is in you than he who is in. Oh, we all got to be involved in this. Greater is he who is in you than he who is. That's right. That is exactly right. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And, and that's why Christ is our friend and our victory is entirely dependent upon that friend, upon the indwelling Spirit. If we don't have the Spirit within us, there is no way we can be victorious over the forces that are so prevalently against us. Romans chapter 8, verse 15 is a passage which allows us to be able to, because of the Spirit, call out, no, cry out to God, Abba, Father. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 2, um, I want to add to that, if I can get over here. Went from Isaiah to Psalms, we went right over Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 2, it says, A servant who acts wisely will rule over a son who acts shamefully and will share in the inheritance among brothers. I mention that because everybody on earth in the literal uh, understanding of it is a child of God. There isn't a person on earth that is not formed with, uh, without the image of God. We're all created in the image of God. You know, the, the, the people that, as Steve said, will come into a place of business and, you know, go off because they're disgruntled about something. You know, uh, some people are disgruntled just because they like to be disgruntled. Um, There is a passage at the end of John, I want to say John chapter 6. Jesus says, did I not choose you twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? 
No, he didn't say. Jesus did not say in that passage, and one of you is behaving devilish, uh, devilishly. He, he pointedly said, one of you is a devil. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 2 is basically telling us that there are those who are not necessarily uh, born within a specific family, but because of their good behavior, the right choices they've made, their faithfulness, God calls them children. That's why we, because of the indwelling Spirit, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 15, can cry out to God, Abba, Father. There is another aspect to the battles that Joshua faced. Turn your Bibles to Judges chapter, uh, Judges chapter 3. Um, I'm going to read the first eight verses here. Because it, it basically describes, uh, some cities that were not taken by the Israelites. When Joshua led them into Canaan land, there, there were cities that were won by faith. Right? We read about Jericho. We read about Ai. It, they, had to, they had to go into that city twice because they did not, by faith, act properly in the first battle, and it affected the second battle. So they had to go into one of the cities twice. Now, these are the nations which the Lord left to test Israel by them, that is, all who had not experienced any of the wars of Canaan, only in order that the generations of the sons of Israel might be taught war, those who had not experienced it formerly. These nations are the five lords of the Philistines, all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites who lived in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon as far as Lebohamath. And they were for testing Israel to find out if they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded their fathers through Moses. So these first few passages are saying, here's some cities that were not taken. There are some amongst the Israelites who have not yet experienced true battle. They may have been trained for it. They may have heard stories about it. They may have been taught these stories by their fathers, by their neighbors but they themselves had not picked up the weapons to face their foes. And so these cities are going to test them. They're going to have to go into battle. And if they're going to go into battle, the point of what we're reading here in verse 4 is that you can be victorious if you obey God. Okay? It continues. In verse 5, the sons of Israel lived among the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Amorites and the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites. But notice what they were doing. They took their daughters for themselves as wives and gave their own daughters to their sons and served their gods. People want to worship, but God is the one who is saying how we're supposed to worship. Don't be worshiping that which you ought not. You may think you're being holy. You may think you're being spiritual, but that could not be farther from the truth. Hear, O Israel, the Lord God is one. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. The sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asheroth. 
Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, so they sold him into the hands of the Christian Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the sons of Israel served Christian Rishathaim eight years. And when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the sons of Israel to deliver them, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel when he went out to war. The Lord gave Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand so that he prevailed over... Uh, that's just a tongue twister there. Uh, verse 11, and uh, then the land had rest 40 years. So... <clears throat> The point here is, if we want to be victorious over any battle, we must use the weaponry that God provides to us. Um, the rest, then, is only going to be available for those who maintain their position. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4. In Hebrews chapter 4, specifically verse 11, what it what it says there is that we are to be diligent to enter that rest, lest any fall through following the same example of disobedience. Um, there is there are three things that we have to keep in mind that this passage provides us. Uh, there is action. There is aim. And there is avoidance. Those three things. Action, aim, and avoidance. So we have an action. We need to be diligent, it says. The, uh, uh, the Greek dictionary that I ha uh, have, this is the way that it defines this word diligent. Okay? It says, use speed. In other words, you don't dink around. In this battle, there's no loitering. There's no sleeping at the guard post. You know, there's some, uh, just by way of mention, um, Brother Aaron is going to be uh, doing some specific research for us because there have been some questions regarding our state's new uh, open carry law. And so he, he, he will be... Uh, given us, uh, you know, two, three, whatever minute, however long he deems necessary for us to understand uh, this law properly, um, he's going to be, be presenting that for us. But um, the point is, is that I'm making here is that if you conceal carry, if you don't have a round chambered, don't bother carrying. Because if someone from 20 feet away, is coming at you with a knife, you do not have time to pull your firearm, charge it, and stop the attack. Being diligent means we are now ready. Not ready five minutes from now, because five minutes from now, the temptation has already overtaken you, and now you find yourself on your knees apologizing once again to God for disobeying Him, begging Him for His mercy and compassion. Be diligent. Use speed, that is to make effort. We have to apply ourselves. This, this, this word effort means I have to discipline myself. And sometimes it's not easy. I don't know specifically what it was that Paul was dealing with. It could have been a physical ailment, but I sometimes... I, I, I can't get around the idea uh, when he said, I have I prayed to God three times that he would remove this thorn in the flesh. The language of that text says, my grace is sufficient for you. What is the purpose of grace if not to save us? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. 
And so I get the idea that Paul's thorn in the flesh was a temptation that he had extreme difficulty facing, and he wanted God just to completely remove that temptation. Self-discipline, effort. We need to be prompt or earnest. Earnest is a, is a, is a word of perseverance. That's the action. There's the aim. We do this action because of what it is we aim for. And what is it we aim for? It's rest. Look at, look at our text here. In, uh, it says here in verse one of chapter four, therefore let us fear lest while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you should seem to have come short of it. The writer of this passage is saying there is a rest Christ died to give you and he's saying there are certain things that we need to involve ourselves so as not to fail in that aim. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. The last verse of chapter 4. Look at verse 4. He has thus said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Now, (laughs) we just said in Genesis chapter 1 that... uh, That God created how? Verse 3, God said. Verse 6, God said. Verse 9, God said. Do you see what I'm saying? If Adam, our son, could go down to the basement, look over there, know what it was that he wanted, the, 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 the flooring, the paint, the fixtures to illuminate the basement, and he said, let it be done. I guarantee he would save himself how many trips to the home improvement store? Right? But at the end of chapter 7, it says, on the seventh day, God rested. I I just don't know how tired God got. I'm not, I'm being human here. I'm not being facetious. I, I know that there is the spiritual side of this. But my human side is, that's what it's seeing, okay? The spiritual side is pointing out that God labored through all of this to give us this creation and set a time at the end of all that labor to rest. The point here is, there is a time at the end of our existence on earth where there is going to be rest. God wants that for us. He says, I have heaven here. I have paradise here. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you John chapter 14. You can go there and rest, kick back and sing songs and praise the good Lord the rest of your days. Amen? We don't want to miss that. Not at all. But that's why we have that avoidance here in 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 verse 11. He says, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Why? Because somebody might fall following an example of disobedience. So there's some things we need to avoid. In verse 6, since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them, Failed to enter. Why? Because of disobedience. Disobedience. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. But I will say to you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That is a text, as we have said before, is a passage that is being spoken to people 
who were trying to follow Jesus. Let's, let's, let's reframe that. These are Christian-minded people that Jesus is going to say, depart from me. Why? Because they failed to obey. Verse 12, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. One of the best weapons that we have in our warfare is God's word. Keep it ever before you. Keep it ever before you. Read. Read something from this Every single day. Don't let a day go by. Because you let that slip. On Tuesday, Wednesday rolls around, and it's not as much on your mind, and you're likely to find yourself on Friday thinking, oh man, what was the last passage of Scripture that I read? You don't want that thought in your mind. You know? Folks, it is clear from the world that surrounds us that there is a great power and force that created it. Romans chapter 1, verses 20 and 21 make this very clear. It points out that there is no excuse. The creation around us removes any excuse from anybody and everybody that God created it. If he's able to do that, just think of everything else that he's able to do specifically for you in your life and for your neighbor. The last couple of phrases from Hebrews chapter 11 tell us that, and this is verses 14, 15, and 16, basically tell us that by faith we have a great high priest. Amen? It tells us that every battle that we face, Every battle that you and I face through any part of any day that we live, Jesus himself, our great high priest, he himself has dealt with it and was victorious. You know why? Because he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. We're no different from him. One of the reasons we suffer is because there's something that I want. There's something that's going to make my life mm, so much easier. But in the mind of God, no, 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 no. Don't go down that path. Do not do that. The third thing that we see there is that he gives to us the needed mercy and grace exactly, exactly at the point in time that we need it. Amen? Man, we have a good God. Is that what you want? This mercy? This grace? Man, I know I do. It's not so much even a want as it is a need. I cannot get through this day without the strength of my Lord. If there's any way at all that we can encourage you in your walk with Christ, let us know, won't you, while we stand and sing?